um, Marco. Marco is the CTO and founder of Kong. And this is a, a fascinating uh, description for the next session. It's connectivity rules everything around me. Well, we know, you know, sort of ain't that the case, Marco? It really is. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us at API Days. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Uh, our absolute pleasure. Um, whilst you're getting your deck on um, um, live, okay, if you can just share it with everybody, I'll tell you as soon as you can see it. Uh, right, we're there. I was going to ask you to say a few words about yourself, but I will let you do that in your own um, sweet time and pass over the baton. It's all yours. I will see you in 20 minutes and um, ask you some questions uh, from our audience. But in the meantime, have fun. Enjoy. Thank you so much. And, uh, and welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about something that's very important. Uh, my name is Marco Palladino, and I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong. I'm very excited to be here today because we're going to be addressing the single most important thing that every modern application must do right. We are in a, in a new era of software, uh, an era of software that was initiated by Docker in 2013 and Kubernetes in 2014. Um, and in this new era, the future of our application is built around connectivity. And that is because every time a team in any organization builds any new application, they create connectivity. And the more distributed and the more decoupled our applications become and the more connectivity they create. The thing is, our services really talk to each other a lot. And it's not just traditional HTTP, but it can be uh, traditional REST, but it can be gRPC, it can be Kafka. They talk over the network on a different variety of protocols. So let me tell you a story on how I have discovered that this was very important. When I was a CTO at MashShape uh, and we transitioned to microservices, we were so focused on the application themselves and, and decoupling our services from the large monolithic code base that we didn't think as much as we should have of, of connectivity. We, we took for granted that our cloud vendor would give us connectivity that would be safe, it would be reliable, would be secure across all the services that we were building. And then once we pushed our new application in production, nothing worked the way it was supposed to work. Our service connections were failing all the time. We always had to recover from inconsistent state because of those failures. We had to spend a long time fixing and building that service connectivity by ourselves. It was very, very painful. Um, it, was, uh, it was like sailing around the world and focusing on the immediate needs, in our case, transitioning away from the monolith uh, and forgetting to, you know, to bring food on board. And so halfway through, we're going to be having a big, big problem. And um, we didn't think of connectivity until it was too late. Um, so don't make the same mistake I did. In a modern world, we succeed only if our services are talking to each other in a secure, reliable, and observable way. If our connectivity is down, our application is down. And so connectivity is such an important task. It's such an important thing to build. It's the backbone of every modern application. But then who's in charge of building it? If the application teams are in charge of building our applications and the infrastructure teams, the architects, are in charge of, of provisioning that underlying infrastructure, is it the application teams or the architects that should build this connectivity? It is the architects, but in many organizations, it is the application teams that do it. So let's take a look and, uh, and see what happens when the application teams are in charge of building service connectivity in addition to building their applications, in, in addition to do what they should be doing, which is focusing on the users and the customers. So the application teams will typically create, create an application. And this application, it is going to be having many different services. And so they go ahead and create the first service. And then they go ahead and create another service. These services can be services that we build or it can be services that we adopt, like, for example, um, a database or a Redis, Redis service. Um, and so we go ahead and we build these services. And then sooner than later, we'll realize that we'll have to secure our services. And so they go ahead and they build 
their security uh, functions that allow to encrypt and provide an identity to our services. And then they will need to route these requests across different versions of the services in order to being able to implement canary releases or blue-green deployments. And then the other service, of course, doesn't live under a rock. It will also need to have security. And then we are going to be needing observability. We want to figure out what the logs are, and then we are wanting to build that across all the services that we're building. Um, eventually, we are going to be accepting traffic from other teams, other applications, or from an ecosystem of partners or mobile apps that are living outside of our application. And so we build those authentication authorization concerns. And then we want to rate limit those requests. And perhaps at one point, there's a lot going on. We want to build tracing. There is a lot that the teams are building every time they create a new application. And different applications, different services, perhaps different teams using different programming languages are going to be reinventing the wheel over and over again. And then we introduce a new service. And all of a sudden, we have to build versioning for that new service and security all over again. And then when a new application comes in, all over again, we're going to be building all of these concerns. And some of these applications are running on one cloud vendor. Some of them are going to be running on another. Perhaps some of them are containerized, and some of them are virtual machine based. And then we'll have to discover these services. When the teams are in charge of building service connectivity, they're going to be building it in a fragmented way. Service connectivity should not be their job. Their job should be building the application itself. Service connectivity should come out of the box for the underlying infrastructure. When the teams are building connectivity, they build fragmentation. And when they build fragmentation, they build unreliability. Unreliability generates errors in our business. It brings down the applications. It creates a poor experience for our users and our customers. So we must fix this. So we must fix this from an infrastructural standpoint. So we know that the teams are going to be running uh, connectivity across three different use cases. We're going to be having connectivity that is going to be coming from the edge, like an ecosystem of partners, like mobile applications, like a developer community. So we build apps and we want to offer an API because we want it to become a platform. Uh, we're going to be having connectivity across the applications. So one team is going to be consuming the APIs of another team. And we're going to be having connectivity in the application as we transition more and more of our applications to be microservice oriented, to be decoupled, and to be distributed. And we know that our teams are going to be doing this across every architectural pattern that they decide to use for their own application. And they're going to be using this across every platform that the organization it is going to be using. It is important that we as architects are thinking on about how we can provide this connectivity for these three different use cases across all these different architectural patterns, across all the platforms that our teams are going to be using. Multiple cloud vendors, virtual machines, Kubernetes as well. And so we must have a strategy in place for this. So when it comes to these three different use cases, uh, we can use different technologies to address them. Uh, for example, uh, when we're running uh, at the edge, we can use uh, an API gateway, an edge gateway, to accept these incoming requests. We can also enforce onboarding uh, flows in order to determine how a developer should provision their, their credentials, how they should be consuming and exploring and discovering the APIs. And then we can, uh, for the cross-application use case, we can also use a gateway to determine, to create an abstraction layer on top of the services and the APIs that we want to expose. Uh, to other teams that are within the organization. And likewise, in an edge gateway, uh, the internal gateway can also enforce onboarding rules for a team to be able to start using the APIs of another team or another application. We want to be able to implement on both of these use cases, the edge and the internal uh, user governance flows that determine how APIs can be accessed and perhaps even block or, or limit the usage for some of those consumers. And then as we transition our applications more and more into becoming microservices, we are going to be adding more and more of that connectivity in app. And for that, we can use a pattern called service mesh. Service mesh, um, it's a pattern that we're going to be taking a look at, um, implies having a sidecar proxy next to each replica of our services. And it's not an applicable pattern if you want to enable users or consumers or clients 
outside of the organization to consume our APIs because we cannot force a sidecar on somebody else and we don't want their sidecar to talk to our control plane. But so let's take a deeper look into service mesh and what this really is. Like I said, um, when the application teams are building services, even if that service is a monolithic application, they're going to be building functionality. They're going to be writing code to determine how to secure, to route, to log, to trace those requests over the network that our applications are making, that our services are making. But what if we, we extracted these uh, connectivity management component away from these services, away from the applications themselves, and we put it in a, in a third party binary, in an executable that we could potentially run next to our services, regardless on how our services are being built. In this case, we don't really care anymore if the service is building one, if built in one language or another language, if it's a VM or a container-based service, as long as we do have a third-party process that can be executed next to our services, effectively that is a portable network management um, you know, uh, executable that we can carry around everywhere within the organization. Now, thankfully for us, we don't have to do this from scratch, uh, but we can also use existing technologies that allow us to implement this functionality. So if we did extract these um, network management away from our services in a third party uh, binary, uh, we could now use this binary as a proxy for any outgoing request that our services are making to any other service. So the service would make a request to another service and that request will be intercepted and it will be then processed by this executable that will, at that point, enforce security, tracing, mutual TLS, and all sorts of things without having to build a line of code in our service, in the originating service. This is very powerful. Effectively, our executable becomes a proxy that intercepts all the requests and can apply security and all of these commonalities without us having to build them and without us having to change our services, how our services are being built. And so if we did this, we also want to make sure that this service runs on the same underlying host or virtual machine or Kubernetes pod in order to make sure that the network latency between the service and this binary is as low as possible. Now, of course, one way to do that is to make sure that the service can make that request, and that request is being uh, processed by this proxy on the same underlying machine. Therefore, making sure that we can cut our network latency by as much as we can. Now, of course, if the, if the value that the binary provides, it is big enough and that um, you know, uh, security and observability and avoidance of fragmentation is big enough, we're willing to have a little bit of network latency, which should be very minimal, in order to get all the benefits that the proxy provides. Now, of course, if you want to enforce uh, mutual TLS end-to-end -end and tracing end-to-end -end and observability end-to-end -end without changing our applications, without writing more code, then we also must have one of these proxies on the receiving end of our requests. And so just like this, we have a service wanting to consume another service, but on the originating service that request goes through a proxy, the proxy will now apply end-to-end -end security, end-to-end -end encryption. And then once that request is being received by the other service, it is actually being processed first by the same executable, which now acts as a reverse proxy, which will then reverse proxy the request to the local service on the other end. So effectively, the contact points of our requests are not the services anymore, but they are these proxies that we have running next to each other, next to each replica of each service that we're building. Now, like I said, we don't have to build this proxy. This proxy um, have already been built. There is many different implementations out there, but one of the most successful ones is Envoy. So Envoy proxy, it's a very lightweight C++ uh, L7 proxy that provides all of these functionalities for us and for our teams to use without having to build them over and over again in our applications, therefore, making uh, a more building a more reliable architecture for our systems the uh, the uh, application teams that are building the services that are building the applications don't even have to be aware that there is a proxy next to their applications all of this can be baked into the, inf the into the uh, provisioning of the underlying infrastructure so whenever there is a new service that's being deployed that process that deploys the CI/CD that deploys the service can inject 
this uh, proxy next to each service and the application teams will just make requests and receive requests from their services without even knowing that everything else is being taken care of, like the retries, the timeouts, the health checks, the circuit breakers is being taken care of by, by this proxy. Now, we're going to be having an instance of this proxy across every replica of every service. Um, we want to make sure that each one of these different replicas has a, an identity, and we want to make sure that traffic is always encrypted from one service to another, because we want to promote a zero trust security model which is um, a way of saying that we're going to be removing trust from our architecture. Therefore, every service and every request must present an identity in order to uh, identify themselves with, with another service. Uh, we also want to have end-to-end -end observability, retries, failovers, and so on and so forth. And so this must be next to every replica of every service. Now, of course, because we're going to be having many of these proxies running around, it is, it is very important that the proxies themselves are very lightweight because if they were not, they would consume lots of resources in our in our systems. Now, obviously, we don't want to change the configuration, the networking configuration for our connectivity manually by changing it for in, in, individually for each one of these different proxies. We want to make sure that we have a control plane, a source of truth that we can use to settle the connectivity configuration that the proxies will then fetch dynamically in order to apply the rules that we want to apply. And so, for example, if we want to change our routing rules from one service to another, we would do that on the control plane. The control plane will then generate a configuration that these proxies can fetch in order to make sure that the routing is being applied the way we want it to apply it. Now, the control plane is very important. Without a control plane, we would be in charge on the hook of making sure that the configuration for each proxy, and like I said, this can be thousands, tens of thousands of proxies, running next to each replica of each service are going to be always up to date and they're going to be configured the right way. So the control plane, it is required. Well, so if the control plane is the source of truth, what the, the proxies end up being on the data plane, on the data processing path of the service to service requests. The control plane only talks to the, to the data plane proxies. It never, never is on the execution path of the service to service requests. Um, as a matter of fact, the control plane could should go, be able to go down and the data plane to data plane proxy traffic should not be affected by it uh, because the data plane proxies will have the latest configuration in memory. This is a very a common uh, concept that really uh, exists already in, in physical networking. So if we're building a physical data center and we're adding lots of servers, lots of switches, lots of racks, and we wanted to configure how the physical switches, the routers, the physical firewalls, are being configured, well, we don't want to literally step into each one of these racks, you know, open the cage and connect with our computer to configure the switches and the routers. We want to have a source of truth that we can access the, the control plane that will then configure this physical infrastructure um, for us uh, automatically. The same concept we're looking at, the, the same concept is now being reproposed um, in, in the software world. So this is a software control plane that connects to software data planes and allows us to configure how the networking among all of our services is going to work. Now, this is really what service mesh is. Service mesh means that we are not going to be building our connectivity management inside of the applications. By doing so, we're going to be increasing the efficiency of the application teams because now they can focus fully on their goal, which is building the apps and the services, not managing the network. And we make the application teams consumers of connectivity, not builders of connectivity anymore. And this is a very, very important. It's very important in order to provide a reliable foundation for our applications moving forward across any platform. In the control plane, it is going to be that component that we're going to be using to managing this service mesh infrastructure. Now, there is many control planes um, that are available. Um, that you can use. Being the CTO of Kong, we have built one called Kuma, which is uh, open source, and anybody can go ahead and use it and download it um, and at Kuma.io. And so Kuma has, has been built on top of Envoy, but not only that, Kuma has been donated to the CNCF Foundation as the first Envoy-based service mesh to ever be accepted within the foundation. So now Kuma is accepted 
is um, it, it can be used with the same governance, with the same neutrality, with the same openness as any other CNCF project that is available today, like Envoy Proxy. Today, Qume is a sandbox project, but we're planning to step up and level up um, through the you know CNCF um, you know uh, incubation process uh, sometime this year. So we took a look at uh, managing connectivity. Um, you know, we introduced the problem of connectivity across the edge, across the different applications, and across different and, and across uh, different services that belong to an application. It is important that we also have a nice strategy to connect our service meshes with those edge and cross application use cases. Otherwise, our applications would leave under a rock. And uh, and again, at Kong, we've done some work to integrate both the gateway and, and the service mesh together in a full stack end-to-end -end connectivity platform that's fully built on top of open source foundations that we can use today to enable that edge connectivity through the Kong gateway and then using that Kong gateway as an ingress to the service meshes that can be created with Kuma and with Kong mesh. Um, then the service meshes within the context of a mesh that can be distributed across multiple zones. And I'm very proud of saying that with Kuma, we built and the open source community, we built one of the best multi-zone deployments that the industry has ever seen with global and remote control plane separation for automatic service mesh policy propagation, as well as cross zone connectivity that happens out of the box, including multiple clouds, multiple regions, as well as a hybrid of containers and virtual machines. And then of course, if there is a subset of APIs that within the organization we want to offer to another team, we can also use the gateway internally to achieve that. So this is the full stack and the end-to-end -end when it comes to managing our connectivity across any platform, any environment, from north-south to east-west, from API gateway to service mesh. We looked at a new era of software, a new era of software where as the software becomes more distributed and more decoupled, connectivity becomes more and more important. Building reliable connectivity, it is going to be a must for every modern application. Failure to do so, it is going to be creating unreliable applications, therefore is going to be damaging our business. We looked at how we can use the mesh and the API gateway to address the three most common connectivity use cases at the edge, across the apps, and within the application with a deeper dive on how service mesh works. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me here, as well as I'm available online on Twitter, or you can check out kongh.com uh, if you want more information. Thank you. Marco, absolutely wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Um, we have a couple of minutes, and I would like to ask you your um, top three tips, if you if you were to sort of condense and praise everything you've just said into, into three bullet points, what would they be? Your key takeaways, please. Connectivity, it is something that the architects must provide to the application teams. We cannot let our application teams build that in a fragmented way in an in a inefficient way. It's not their job. So that's number one. Uh, when we provide connectivity to every application that the teams are creating, we must understand how that can be provisioned across every architecture that the application teams are going to be using, microservices, uh, serverless, uh, monoliths, as well as making sure that we can provide it in a platform agnostic way on every cloud, every platform, Kubernetes, and virtual machines. And in order to do that, we must provision under the hood these API gateways and service meshes that are being provisioned as the environment is being provisioned so that we, we can uh, provide that out of the box to the teams. So today a team comes to us and they want to have an environment like a Kubernetes cluster, for example, to build a new application, we would provision that for them. In addition to that, we must provision the service mesh that runs within that Kubernetes cluster and the gateway or the ingress controller that runs within that Kubernetes cluster so that the connectivity is being taken care of for them since they won. Likewise, their workloads are being taken care of since they won. Fabulous. What a way to finish. Marco, everybody can find you on LinkedIn. Um, everybody can find your, your deck in this recording. Uh, we will be sharing. All that remains for me to say is thank you very, very much uh, for sharing your insight. Absolutely wonderful, as I said before. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marco.